So this is Mahmoud El-Sawi from uh, Atlantis, uh, Atlantis uh, Project Team. And today I'm going to discuss with you one of our recent uh, research direction related to flat optics for future daily applications. But before we start, just one slide about the, my education and my background. So I obtained my bachelor degree from Egypt in uh, 2009 in uh, applied mathematics. In 2014, I obtained my master's degree in mathematical modeling and engineering. It was an Erasmus Mundus uh, program. As uh, Damian said, in 2017, I obtained my PhD from the University of, uh, from University of X, X Marcel, we specialized in uh, optics and photonics and uh, image processing. And I joined the, the group of Stéphane Lantry in 2018 as a postdoctoral researcher, uh, when I was working in, uh, in the field of inverse design of photonics. And since December 2020, I have been recruited as an area starting faculty position, where I am working in the modeling and design of nanophotonics components. So uh, just uh, just uh, one picture to summarize what's going on, what I'm doing here in the in the team. I'm just at the interface between the two worlds. What you see in the left in the field of applied mathematics, and which is represented in Ria and Daijin software, and the, the permanent researchers and Atlantis project team. And from the other hand, uh, I'm just in the interface between this world and the, and the physical and the physics lab, like Ria, Institute Finet, MTST, and the industrial industrial personnel. So what I'm doing actually in the team is just connecting the two worlds together, doing application, doing simulation, optimization, and trying to valorize what's happening here in the team using the tools and to do real uh, configuration, real structure that is really useful for the, from the application point of view and also for our society. So today I'm going to talk about um, one of these directions, which is flat optics for real life applications. And I will start with the introduction. So we are already familiar with uh, the classical or traditional optical components like it, like lenses, optical filters, beam splitters, prism. So as you can see here, you have a piece of glass, and this piece of glass needs to be really engineered, needs to be really structured in order to focus light, for example, if you want to make a lens, or to filter light, or to split the light into, into different directions. One of the most common applications, or one of the most common uh, components is a lens. And actually, how this lens is working, it's very simple. We already know from the, let's say, the high school physics that, okay, when you have a, a light, which is propagating with light, which is propagating here, and it just hits the, the, the lens, which is just a piece of glass, which is carefully engineered, carefully designed, such that the light is a little bit delayed in the center of the lens, and it's a little bit fast at the edges. And if you do this, you will be able to focus light at a specific position as you wish. Nevertheless, if you would like to do something which is more difficult, which is to focus three different colors at the same point, you have something which is called chromatic aberration. You cannot do it. So what you have to do is to correct for this aberration by stacking several lenses together to correct for this aberration, which means you might be able to focus all the three different colors at the same point or creating an image at this point. Well, this is very interesting because this is what you see actually in your cell phone. Actually, in your cell phone, it's a little bit bulky because you have to stack many lenses together here. For example, in this latest uh, cell phone, you have to stack like more than 14 lenses together in order to improve the imaging, in order to improve the, the, the capability of, of the lens. This is quite costly and quite bulky, actually. Why also? Because the, the, the lens here, the, the, the glass has to be carefully engineered in order to, in order to focus light. So here it's very, it's very uh, difficult to manipulate. So now we are living in everything is everything is is is, uh, is shrinking. And so we have uh, smaller laptops, smaller computers, smaller everything actually. But we cannot do the lens much more than this because it's as I said, it relies on the on the piece of glass that has to be engineered correctly. And if you want to control light properties at smaller uh, distance, at smaller at the nano scale, for example, you have to find a way to control these properties. And also, not only that, you need to have high resolution because you need to do applications and you need to have, rely on cheaper technology because you want to sell it. So it's much more complicated. So the solution is in what is called meta surfaces. So what is meta surfaces? And instead of relying on this bulky uh, piece of glass that has to be engineered, for example, to focus light, what do you do? Is you just consider an array of optically sent resonators that you can see here made of glass, the same material, but they have to be smaller than the wavelengths and dimensions and it has to be, they have to be also organized or engineered in a specific way to give you the desired functionality. For instance, I can have, I can, be, I can imagine here such kind of performance if I want to focus light. I can 
distribute the, the elements here such that the light will be delayed in the center and it will be faster here at the edges. And in this case, I can make a lens. In other words, I can also use it to split light into directions or to deflect it to the specific position. So this gives you a very important uh, control of how you can control the light properties at a smaller distance, at a smaller, uh, smaller dimensions. This is quite interesting, actually. But to show you what's going on here from the equation point of view, we already know Snell's law. Huh? Snell's law is okay if you, if you have a light which is incident here from a material with refractive index N1 which to material N2. So the incident angle is theta i. So based on the Snell's law, you have this rule and the light needs to be refracted in a specific angle which is called theta i. You have no options actually. That's how it works. But you can imagine the other situation. If you put here nanostructure metal surfaces here, nanostructure res nanoresonators here on the top, you can actually introduce this term in the right-hand side. And this term in the right-hand side, which is d5 by dx, it's called the phase gradient. Actually, if you want to make a phase gradient, for example. So you introduce an additional phase, which will allow you to change the directivity of the light. And instead of going here to the theta r, I can imagine direct the light at any angle as I wish, which is giving to you a huge functionality, a huge flexibility, in controlling all the light properties. Actually, it was a revolution in 2001 by this uh, nice paper which is published in Science that you can generalize the Snell law and actually can do these nice, interesting, and very interesting properties. So what can we do with this? Actually, we can do a lot, actually. You can, since this uh, 2005, for example, it started from 2005, you can make a meta lens, you can focus three different colors at the same point, you can make a nice hologram, you can send, you can make a nice hologram, you can use it to light, to emit light, or even you can use it to make uh, a, a bright color uh, images here. So you have a, sm a small sheet of metasurfaces here, which is like one micrometer in thick, very, very, very thin, and it can give you this height, uh, this nice uh, properties. Recently also a, a, a group of Capasso at Harvard has shown that you can use the uh, concept of metasurfaces in virtual reality, actually. And this is really, really a revolution in this field. So this is all of these things can be done with metasurfaces. So in conclusion, this metasurface can give you an arbitrary engineering. You can arbitrarily engineer the optical response of any medium to create a spectacular effects. This is quite interesting by doing this uh, uh, technology, which is called the metasurface for flat optics. So instead of using the bulk lens, you can have it in a small surface. So uh, what we do from the mathematical point of view, well, uh, you have uh, some light which is coming, so you have to solve some equation. And this equation is actually an actual equation. And that's what we do here in the team. Huh? We use Maxwell equation, but we are here kind of specialized and we are using some kind of software, which is the regime, which is based on this continuous Gaia method huh? to deal with this, uh, to solve the Maxwell equation, at least for the moment in the linear case. So uh, it's another photonics so because here we are dealing with a wavelength for the incoming light between 400 nanometer and 700 nanometer from the green light, from sorry, from the red light to the blue one. So we are controlling all the visible regime, but also we can do it in the infrared or microwave regime. It is the same technique, actually. So the most important thing here that you should be able to, to do what? You should be able to control light-matter interaction at the nanoscale. You should be able to rely on a solver, which is able to capture the strong near-field coupling, the interaction between the light and this nanoresonator that will allow you to give you the desired functionality. So you go to the second section, which is how to design a metasurface. Well, well, to design a metasurface, you need some requirements. And the first requirement, as I said, you need to control a wave front. You need to control a wave front, which means that you need to have a two pi phase control. You need to control the, the phase by the full phase control. So what you do, you consider a smaller element, just one pixel of this guy, and you put a periodic boundary condition around it. So what you do here, you need to change one parameter, let's say, the width or the height, such that you are sure that doing so, you can control or you can cover from 0 to 2 pi. I repeat again, you need from 0 to 2 pi because you need to control the wavefront. You need to, to, to make a lens, you need to deflect light, you need to, to do whatever you want. You need to control the wavefront. On the other hand, also, you need to have a, a constant amplitude. You need to have high resolution, actually. You need to have a bright light. So you need the, the reflection or the transmitted light to be almost 100%. So this is first requirement. So uh, from the physical point of view, I will not enter to the details here, but to get the two pi, it's not easy. You need to be sure that this nanoresonator, the pixel that you, you, you have chosen, is able to provide you this two pi. And for that, 
to summarize, there are three different ways to ensure that this pixel is going to give you a two pi from zero to two pi variation. The first one is what we call the effective refractive index approach. Very simple. Imagine that you have two materials, substrate and material. So we know that the maximum phase that we can get is given by this equation. But if I put air instead of this material, you have the minimum phase that you can get because N air is the refractive index of air, which is one. But now imagine that I do some kind of non-structuring of this material here. So I can be, I can obtain a phase between phi, phi minimum and phi maximum, which is really dependent on the height of this standard resonator and the delta N. So what is the height? It's the height of this guy. And what is delta N? Is the effective mode uh, index, which is how the light is interacting with each of these nano resonators. What does it mean? You need just to play with one parameter, let's say the radius here, for example, if it's a pillar, or the width, or whatever you prefer. You engineer this delta N, and if you engineer this delta N, well, you are happy because you have phi minimum control between, you can control the phase between phi min and phi max, and you can have a full two pi control. The other approach is a little bit more complicated, which is, let's say, let's say re related, I'm sorry, up, related to the resonance approach. So what does it mean? Instead of relying on a tall nano resonator, you consider very thin nano resonators. Okay, so this kind of nano disks. So what you do here, look at the blue, please, and the, and the, and the, and the red curve. So you have two resonances, you excite this, you, you shine light, and you have two resonances, the blue one and the red one. Trying to to play with the parameters a little bit, you can have an overlap between the two resonances here. The blue and the red one could be one here. Why this is interesting? Because each of these resonances here, if you look at the phase response, is going to give you from zero to pi, only one pi. So one pi for the red, one pi for the blue. But if you mix them together, if you have the overlap, you can have the full two pi configuration. You can have the, two, the full two pi modulation. So this is another technique to control the two pi and to be sure that this resonator is going to give you the desired response. Well, the last, uh, uh, I don't know why it's not working. Just a second. Yes, sorry. So it's called the geometrical phase or the polarization control. So instead of controlling only the amplitude of the phase, you can control the polarization of the, of the light. And this is quite simple, actually. You design another resonator which is working like a half of plate. Okay, I'm not going to discuss it, but it's interesting. Now what's going on here, you just, you, you just start to rotate this nano resonator. And once you rotate this nano resonator from zero to pi to 180 degree, you can cover the two pi phase. This is what we call Bansharatman barrier phase or a geometrical, a geometrical phase. Why this is interesting? Because I can shine light with a specific polarization, for example, here, and I got this logo of the scenery. Everything, everybody now would be happy. But now if I shine light and put another, uh, this nano element with a specific uh, orientation and shine again uh, the light with a specific polarization, I can get this guy. So which means I can do whatever I want because I control the full properties of the light in a very flat surface, which is like one micrometer instead of this bulky lens, which is a really a revolution in this, uh, in this field. So now we know how to control it, how to get a two pi. Now, Imagine that I want to make a lens. So now I am sure that this nano resonator is going to give me the requirements, which means high amplitude, high reflection, or high transmission, and a control of the phase from zero to two pi. Now, imagine that I want to make a lens. What should I do? To make a lens, you have an analytical equation here that you see, which is the phase characterization. So you just synthesize the phase in, in, in a map, right? And you try to put the, cor the, the corresponding element at each point. For example, in the middle, I need a two pi. So I put the element which is corresponding to, that will give me two pi in the phase. Here I need, for example, let's say a phase by 60 degrees. So I put the element which corresponded to this. And as soon as you do this, you get the response and then you get a focusing lens. This technique is important, is interesting. Nevertheless, it neglects the near coupling between, near field coupling between the elements. And of course, the efficiency will not be very good at the end of the day. The other approach is to rely on some, something which is called the inverse design approach. You say, okay, look, I know that this resonator is going to give me the requirements that I need. Then let us try to use an optimization method and we set up an objective such that we focus light or deflect it or whatever you want. But in this case, we will not rely on this synthesizing approach. We will put the elements and we change the distance in between them. We change the dimensions and we see how we can really optimize this this, this performance. And of course, you can rely on local methods like topology optimization, you, which, or you can use global optimization method like the evolutionary strategies, or you can use a neural network, 
method. So you know, this method had been summarized in, in, in our recent review here. So what do we do here? You know, topology optimization, it's a local method actually, because you are going to, 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 to be stuck in a local minimum, which is not very useful. The global methods like the evolution and strategies is again, quite interesting here, but here you are sure that you're going to converge to the global minima. Nevertheless, you require a lot of simulation to, to converge. Neural network, well, you can adapt it to for inverse design technique, which is also quite interesting. Nevertheless, you need to do perform a lot of simulation to train your network, which is again, very costly. So what do we do? In our team, we do the following. We, our numerical methodology relies on two pieces. The first one is a Daijin, which is the electromagnetic, electromagnetic solver based on this continuous galerical method to really uh, characterize the near field coupling and interaction between the lights and these nano resonators. This is very important. The second point is an optimization technique. And for that, we rely on what is called EGO. It's an efficient global optimization technique. Why we do this? Because it's a Bayesian optimization method. It relies on an iterative refinement of the surrogate model, which means it does not require too much simulation. And in our case, it's a DGTD uh, code. And it can be adapted for multi-objective optimization that I'm going to show you, right? So this brings me to the third part of my, uh, of my talk, which is related to the applications. So what do we do with this? So now we know a metasurfaces replaces this uh, bulky, let's say, uh, optical components. We know how to design a metasurface because we have some requirements. That's good. How to model this metasurfaces? We have two approaches, the classical approach, or you rely on the optimization. In our case, we rely on optimization, and our optimization method is this EGO. And now what do we do with this? What do we do with this? Imagine that we have this current application. You want to design an optical component such that you send the light from the bottom, and you want to deflect light by a certain angle. OK, and this thing has to be very thin. So what do we do? We consider the following situation. We consider four pixels, and we put periodic boundary condition in X and Y, which means that this pixel or this supercell is repeated in X and Y. Okay, it's a periodic boundary condition. So each of these nano resonators, they have different diameter, D1 until D4, and also the distance in between, they are different. So we vary here seven parameters and we try to optimize the distance in between and also the diameters in order to have the desired response. To do this, we do two um, optimization. The first one is the covariance matrix adaptation evolutionary strategy, CMIS. And in this case, as you can see, we have almost 500 iterations to converge to a very good performance. Actually, this is a minimum, all right? So one minus the, F, uh, the, the one minus eta, it's the minimization problem, right? So here you have 500 iterations to converge. Nevertheless, if you perform the EGO, which is split in two parts, what you first do is the design of experiment part. Here we use like uh, 70 uh, iterations. No, yes, it's like yeah, 80 iterations, which is shown here in blue. The best design in the design of experiment is shown here. And after that, you perform the second phase based on this on the meta model that you are going to construct from this uh, design of experiment and you converge quite rapidly. And actually 150 iterations are quite uh, more than enough to converge to the desired design. And if you look here at the performance of the two cases, for example, here we were interested in, at, at maximizing the response at a specific wavelength, which is 600 nanometer. We see that the two meds are almost the same with a very small um, uh, change in the parameters. So this is the response that we get from our server. The light is coming from below. Each of these nano resonators deals with the light in a specific way that we don't care because it's very interesting actually. And you see that the near field coupling between the nano resonators is quite important here. So you need a quite rigorous solver to be able to describe this. And we see that the light goes to the specific direction as you wish, which is really, really interesting. Now we go to the second application. What do we want? We want to do a multi-objective optimization. So, as I mentioned before, one of the most important applications in this field is a meta lens. Light comes like that with three different colors, and you want to focus it. To correct for the chromatic aberration, the traditional approach proposes you to stack several lenses together in order to correct for this chromatic aberration. Okay, we are happy. And now we want to replace this bulky system with a meta surface, which is like one micron, and to see if it can give us the same response or not. So what do we do? We consider a metasurface. We consider a structure of nano of nano resonators in this kind of circular array. Sorry, in this circular array. Due to the symmetry of the structure, we consider one quarter only of the structures, and we optimize the nano resonator along the radial direction, which is what you show, what you see here in, uh, in yellow. And we optimize also the distances in between. 
how many parameters do we have here? We have almost 16 parameters. And we have three objectives that has to be satisfied at the same time. Indeed, if you have questions, I can discuss with you about how this method is working and uh, an optimization in a single objective and also multi-objective, if you have. So how we do this? So if you do this kind of optimization, this is what you get, actually. So from the numerical simulation, after two, only 200 iterations, actually, yeah? you see you have 16 optimization parameters, you have three objectives, and we do only 200 iterations, 200 solver core, which is really, really impressive in this kind, in this field, actually. So what do we do here? We have a meta surfaces that focus three different colors, three different wavelengths at the same point. So the focal, the desired plane is what you see here in, in, in white. And here, each of these one represent a specific wavelength. Of course, there are some error, which is quantified by 6%, but it's really impressive. We manage also to fabricate this kind of structure with, uh, with a group of Patrice-Jules Wave from CRIA, and that's what I said in the beginning. The goal of this ISFP of what I'm doing is just to make the balance, to make the connection between what we do here in RIA and the physical world. So we managed to fabricate the structure, and actually we have a very good agreement between the numerical simulation and the fabricated bits, which is quite interesting, and it has been published in SEC Photonics, which is one of the most interesting um, uh, academic journals in this world. Now, if you look at the efficiency here, you might say, oh, look, uh, you have 45% uh, efficiency, which is quite low. Indeed, no. If you compare this work with the other uh, meta surface in, 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 in the literature, you see the following. So what you see here in the first column is the numerical aperture, okay? And here is the diameter, and here is the efficiency. As you can see, for most of the numerical aperture, it's quite, it's quite small. Actually, we are not very interested in small numerical aperture, which means that the lens is going to focus quite far. But what we are interested in here, is we are trying to, we are trying to to focus light for large numerical aperture. When you increase the numerical aperture, the efficiency drops a lot. And here, this kind of design, we were the first to propose high numerical aperture up to 0.5 or 0.52, something like this, with an overall efficiency with three different colors, about 45, 45%, which is quite high actually. So that's the first, uh, the second application. So now we, we did it for single objective optimization, we did it for multi-objective optimization, but there is a missing part. And the missing part, which is called the fabrication imperfections. Okay, so as I said in the beginning, to consider a meta surface, you need to consider very small nanoresonators. And these small nanoresonators in the order of like 100 nanometer or even less. To control it from the experimental point of view, it's not easy, right? We can ask for 100 nanometer, and they gave us 105, 110. Indeed, the performance is not the same. So they came up with, okay, do we have a, a, a way to control, to take into account the fabrication imperfections in our design, such that we propose to them a robust design? What does it mean? Let us try to imagine that we have a response which is represented here by the black, by the black curve. Indeed, the best design, best corresponding to this parameter that is going to give you the best design. Nevertheless, if you try to make a small perturbation, which is shown here in red, to this optimal parameter, you see that the optimal design, the optimal performance is really violated, which is not what we want, actually. On the other hand, if you consider the green design here, that is corresponding to the robust optimum here, you see that the optimal response is quite robust. What does it mean? It means that the change of the, perfor the performance is not very changing. This is quite interesting from the nanophotonic point of view. We are really interested in this. The question is, how do we do this, actually? Well, to do this, because again, we are relying on a Bayesian optimization, which is a, a statistical learning optimization technique based on meta model. So what do we do? We don't need to perform further simulation. What do we do? So you consider the design of experiment, as I mentioned before, represented here by these five points. Sorry, by these six points. Once you have it, you construct the meta model, which is shown here in orange. Okay, this is the meta model. What does it mean for this meta model? You have access about all the information, about all the parameters here. We, instead of doing more, more simulation, you did only five simulation, and you have access about you have access to all the design here. So now, if I do a perturbation, for example, to this parameter uh, space, what is happening here? I also have the response here, which is shown here, right? I have the response for each perturbation for each. Uh, point. For example, if the optimal here is x, I can make x plus delta x or x minus delta x, and look at the corresponding response here without need, without without needing no need actually no need to do further additional simulation for that because the meta model is going to give you the response. 
What do we do with this? We optimize the mean and the variance of this response. And we do multi-objective optimization on this. So what we do here, we optimize the mean and the variance, and we, keep up, we came up with a robust design. We are not really interested in a design that gives us the best performance. Nevertheless, we are interested in a design that is going to, to be robust to the fabrication performance. And this fabrication uncertitude, it's free. You can give us as much as we want, actually. We, are, we have no restrictions here. You just need to rely on some fabrication uncertitude from the, from the lab, from the physical lab, we plug that in our solver, in the simulation, in the optimization, and we came up with a robot design. And the results are quite impressive here, as you can see. What we do here is that we consider again the same situation as before. We need to, the light is coming from below, and we need to deflect light to a specific angle. But the objective here is different. And instead of searching for the best design, which is a deterministic case, we look for a robust design. So that if you look for the deterministic case, you optimize seven parameters, and this is what you get. You maximize at 600 nanometer the response. You can see that if we perturb the diameter by 12 or minus 12 nanometer, the efficiency drops a lot, actually. Huh? From 85%, it goes to below 60%, which is not good at all. On the other hand, if you include what I explained to you in the UQ study on the mean, which is uncertain quantification analysis inside the optimization, and optimize the mean and variance using the multi-objective optimization, you came up with a robust design as what you can see here. Indeed, the efficiency is not the same. Nevertheless, the design is quite robust. And that's what we are really interested in. When we do fabrication, when we, do, when we go for the industry, we are interested for the robust design and not for the, the, most, uh, the, for the highest efficient design. So just one slide more for the future direction and to show you what's going on here. So in all the examples that I showed to you today, it was for passive metasurface. What does it mean, passive metasurface? It means that the optical properties that we control are fixed during the fabrication procedure, which means you cannot do anything, actually. You have a metal lens, we have a nanostructure, and you cannot do anything. Those are passive metasurfaces. And what we are really working on now is, is called the active metasurface, which means you have your metasurface here, which is a flat surface, but we need to, to find a way such that to turn on and off this metasurface and to get two different functionality. If I turn this metasurface off, then uh, I got this. If I turn it on, I got this response. This is quite interesting, actually. So what do we need here? We need to find a way such that these nanoresonators will be controlled dynamically by applying external voltage, by applying external heat, by ap applying external stimuli. So this is the field of active metasurface and where we are trying to be involved with, and we are actually having starting to have a, a very interesting result here. What is the application of this? Very simple, to make a leader huh? for the autonomous car. So imagine that the light comes like this. Okay? This is the incident angle. And you apply voltage to each of these metasurfaces, to each of these nanoresonators. Sorry. So what happens here? By changing the voltage or by applying external heat, I can turn, I can change the directivity of the light. Instead of directing the light this direction, I can put it here, I can put it there, I can put it there. So imagine now you have an autonomous car, so you will be able to do scan like this, and you will be able to scan all the uh, environment quite rapidly. This is quite interesting, actually, because it does not rely on the big system which is in the, in the autonomous car right now. So this is really the future. The future to go is to rely on this flat optics to metasurface technique in, uh, for future applications. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much.